hello everybody. Welcome to the Open Education Network's Pub 101 series. Thank you for joining us for today's session. And I thought as an opener in chat, we could place like where we're joining from. And if you could tell me what kind of plants are blooming in your area, like if you have a favorite flower or something that's blooming, uh, I think that'd be nice to share. Azaleas, oh, I love azaleas. Coral bells, oh, that sounds pretty. Granville, Ohio, all right, tulips. Yes, I have some tulips blooming too, some like really bright red ones right now with yellow centers. They're beautiful. Lots of tulips. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, you can go ahead and keep adding to it. Um, so I'm Heather Capret. I'm from Cleveland State University where I work as an instructional designer. I'll be your host and facil facilitator for today. And soon I'll be handing it off to Jacqueline Frank from Montana State University to talk about accessibility. And as always, we'll leave time for your questions and conversation. And we know that many of you may be experienced and knowledgeable about this topic in addition to our guests. So we invite you to share your experiences and resources. Lots of people will post links and chat for others to explore. And before I hand it off, I have to do some housekeeping details. Um, we have an orientation document that includes our schedule and links to session slides and recordings. So if you can't make it to a session and you wanna know what you missed, please check out this document. Uh, please remember there's a companion resource to these sessions. It's the Pub 101 Canvas curriculum. And there's lots of links, links there to resources and templates that you can use. We are recording this session and we'll add it to our YouTube Pub 101 Spring 2024 playlist. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for everyone aligned with our community norms. And we ask that you please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. And finally, all the links to the resources just mentioned are found in one place, which I will copy and paste into our chat here. It's a link tree. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jacqueline to talk to you about accessibility. Yes, hello everyone. I am going to share my screen. And start the slideshow. There we go. Uh, so thank you for having me. I am Jacqueline Frank. I'm the Instruction and Accessibility Librarian at Montana State University Library in Bozeman, Montana. And I'm happy to talk with you today about accessibility. And as a reminder, these slides uh, will be linked from the course orientation document after today's presentation. So we have a lot to cover today. Um, we are going to start by first acknowledging that there are challenges related to accessibility. Um, we're also going to cover the briefly note um, the difference between accessibility versus universal design versus inclusive design and kind of what they all have in common and what it means to have an accessibility mindset. So why accessibility matters, uh, why we care and spend time thinking about this. And then the bulk of our presentation will be digging into some accessibility best practices um, and some checkers that you can use, as well as uh, some different document formats that may show up in the world of OER from PDFs to EPUBs to press books. Um, and then talk about briefly um, models for ensuring accessibility. So there are different ways that this can happen um, on different campuses. And then a, a note about AI, um, I would love to hear more from everyone else along the way though about all of these different topics. Um, and then we are going to end with uh, some self care reminders and uh, as well as some resource and training options if you would like more. So first, um, I have a quick participant poll. 
Um, I want to know what type of institution you are from. Are you from a university, a college, a community college, a um, state system, consortium, or other? like lots of people have answered already and uh, the majority about 80 percent are from a university another 13 percent uh, from colleges 10 percent community colleges and then the rest uh, consortium and state systems so great i will stop sharing and share those results so you can see them as well uh, thank you that is along the lines of what we expected, but just wanted to make sure. So starting by acknowledging some challenges, uh, accessibility can often be seen as an add-on. This is one of the biggest challenges that I see, um, as well as the time both to learn about accessibility best practices and how to follow them, and then the extra time it takes to uh, implement those best practices and create accessible material. And the fact that it never ends, 100% accessible doesn't exist. Um, so there, there is a lot of time that is involved in this. And what works for one person doesn't work for everyone. Um, this is a major challenge with accessibility. And uh, that will also never go away because we are all individuals and what works for me might not work for you. Um, but there are some best practices that we can follow to make it the most inclusive and accessible as a starting place. And that also allows users uh, to maybe use assistive technology in ways that works for them um, because you've helped follow some of those best practices. And this ultimately requires a shift in thinking um, and we wanna increase our awareness and understanding um, because oftentimes uh, some people think that it doesn't have a big impact, which we are going to debunk uh, shortly because it really does have a big impact in the end. So universal, universal design versus inclusive design versus accessibility. Um, these are a few of the definitions that are also included in your Pub 101 course. And uh, these definitions are great. Um, it says universal design is the process of creating products that are usable by people with the widest range of abilities, operating within the widest possible range of situations. So this is trying to make something, um, you know, instead of having ramp and stairs, uh, we just only have a ramp so that uh, people don't necessarily need to find an alternative to the stairs. Inclusive design is creating a lot of different ways for people to participate so that as many people as possible can feel as though they belong. And it doesn't mean designing one thing for all people. So going back to uh, that same example, inclusive design would be offering both the stairs and the ramp um, so that people can choose the option that works best for them. And then accessibility is the concept of designing websites, ebooks, textbooks, and other products in such a way that removes barriers so that people with disabilities can access the content. So accessibility is really focused on um, access for people with disabilities, and that is important. Um, and as we will see throughout the presentation, accessibility, um, even though it's specifically designed and intended for people with disabilities, um, it also is useful for almost everyone in the end. So accessibility does benefit everyone. And ultimately, while there are some nuances between those different terms, accessibility, universal design, inclusive design, they all help us design content in ways that more users can access them and with more ease. So that shared goal is really what we are concerned about today. And even though one might have a slightly different approach, 
uh, they can be used in conjunction with one another to, again, just provide access to the widest range of people that we can. There are a couple guiding questions from the Pub 101 course as well. Uh, so when you're thinking about accessibility or universal design, thinking about who this book is for or who this OER is for initially, um, does the book or OER present core concepts through visuals that maybe not all students could see or understand? Does the book present core concepts through multimedia, audio and video materials that not all students may be able to hear, see, or access? And does the book present core concepts in a document format that all students may not be able to access? Um, so these are just some different questions that you uh, can consider along the way to ensure that you uh, stay on track and help pre present accessible material. So having an accessibility mindset from the beginning um, and why accessibility matters um, is important to understand because then you can help authors uh, create accessible material and you can pass this information on to them um, if you get any questions about why uh, you are asking an author to maybe update something for accessibility. So one of the goals of creating open textbooks or open educational resources is that so they can be accessed by more people and with fewer barriers, um, not under a paywall. And so we also want to follow accessibility best practices uh, so that, again, more people can access them. Almost 20% of undergraduates report having a disability, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. And 26% of people um, live with a disability in the United States, according to the CDC. But when we think about it, 100% of people will experience a disability in life if you are lucky enough to live long enough. Uh, so disability also increases with age. And accessibility can be permanent, temporary, or situational. Lots of times we think of, of disabilities as permanent, um, but sometimes if you are injured and have to have a knee surgery and are either on crutches or one of those wheelie scooter things, um, that puts you in a, in a temporary uh, disability state uh, related to mobility. There are also situational uh, disabilities where maybe you have your hands full and therefore aren't as mobile uh, physically like you are holding um, a child or you just have uh, a lot of things to be carrying around, for example. So accessibility is a spectrum. And I will also note here that a lot of accessibility or a lot of disabilities are invisible. The majority of disabilities tend to be invisible, um, especially on college campuses. And if we're thinking about the student audience that we are trying to reach through OER, um, on my college campus, for example, the top three are ADHD, dyslexia, and um, the broad umbrella for learning disabilities. So all of those are invisible disabilities. Accessibility is also a spectrum. There are many assistive technologies, um, even from glasses and contacts to um, other devices like screen readers, we have mobility aids, hearing aids. Um, all of these fall under the category of assistive technologies. And uh, what, what works for one person, again, does not work for everyone. Um, so it is very individual, which again is a challenge, um, but one of the ways that we can combat that is by providing as many options and as formats as possible. So that allows users to choose what works best for them. So when we're thinking about OER, one way to do this is to provide an open textbook in multiple formats, um, including an EPUB, an HTML and a PDF option uh, so that, again, users can choose what works best for them. 
And I mentioned this already, but accessibility benefits everyone. So while it is specifically targeted at um, users with disabilities, there are often benefits um, that benefit all users. So for example, automatic door openers and curb cuts were um, the automatic door openers that you see at your grocery store and uh, the curb cuts where um, it goes from the sidewalk um, and eases down to the roadside. Those were specific design elements for users with disabilities and they we all benefit from those. Headers, um, when you format something with headers, like we're gonna see, it allows users to navigate by section. Closed captioning allows users to view content without sound, uh, even if they do not have a hearing impairment. Transcripts allow users to read the content without video. That can be helpful without internet access or without the bandwidth to view a video. Um, and again, 100% of people will experience a disability in life. Um, so we will all benefit from these at some point or another. So now, I'm going, my chat went away. I'm going to pull up. There we go. Get my chat back just to make sure. Oh, I see a, a question. I love closed captions when I'm working at the reference desk. Yes, exactly. Um, so you may not be hearing impaired, but uh, there are times when you're in a loud environment or a quiet environment um, where you can watch the content and follow along. Yeah, I really like that. Okay, participant poll number two, before we dig into the accessibility best practices, I wanna know how much knowledge and or experience you have with accessibility. Do you have zero? Would you rate yourself low, moderate or advanced? share the results. Uh, most folks have a moderate understanding. Some are low, um, one zero, and then a few advanced. So hopefully you will learn something new, even if you are moderate and advanced. Um, and also please feel free to share uh, your own experiences um, and resources in the chat. We could all benefit uh, from learning from each other. Moving on, um, before digging into those specific best practices, I want to note um, who is often responsible for accessibility. Ultimately, the creator of the or the author of the content is generally responsible. However, uh, that distributed model is challenging and we also as publishers or someone helping faculty uh, publish OER, we want to help make sure that that content is accessible. Um, and so that means knowing what to look for and providing resources to authors if needed. Um, we'll also talk um, at the end about different models for ensuring accessibility. And I am interested to hear, um, we'll try to have time for this to hear how folks are handling this on their own campuses um, so that we can kind of get a range of different ideas of how to approach this. So some of the common best practices that we're gonna look at, um, we can't cover them all. WCAG uh, 2.1 now, sorry, I thought I had updated this, um, but the web content accessibility guidelines uh, are a very robust set of guidelines. And there are many more than the ones that we're gonna talk about today, but these are the ones that are most important for, uh, for OER. So we're gonna talk about headings, meaningful hyperlinks, considering color, captions and transcripts, language considerations, formatting considerations, 
um, and then alt text for images. So headings are a formatting tool. They are used to separate sections of a document. They ultimately help users and screen readers navigate the content easily and quickly um, to jump to specific sections. And you apply them in an outline format. So I have an image on the right here, which is showing um, kind of a book laid out by chapters and then subsections for the chapter. So if we were to apply headings, the book title would be um, a heading one level. And then all of the chapters of the book would be formatted as a heading two level. And then all of the subsections um, under chapter one would be a heading three um, and so on. You can have as many heading levels as you want, um, as makes sense. It just means that um, heading threes are subsections of whatever was the uh, previous heading two, if that makes sense. And headings act as a map of the textbook or a document. It's like a table of contents. Um, and oftentimes, if you are in Word or Pressbooks, uh, you can create an automatic table of contents after you have applied these headings. Um, and as you add content and refresh them, um, all of it stays up to date with correct page numbers um, and everything as well. So the big, the big point here is to know um, that you want to specifically format these as headings rather than faking them with like a bigger and bold text uh, and actually apply a heading style. And we're usually I try to show like in Word how to do this, for example, but there are different publishing platforms. You might be in Word, you might be in Pressbooks, uh, you might be in any number of different formats. So we're not going to specifically talk about the how, um, but if you would like to know how to apply headings or any of the best practices, um, please let me know and I can either answer that when we have questions um, or follow up with you afterwards. Meaningful hyperlinks. We want to actually tell the user where the link is going to take them and avoid trying to paste the full URL um, and avoid using click here as a link. So you really wanna let the link be the title of the content itself. Um, so as an example, if you wanted to let users know that they can chat with a librarian from the MSU library homepage, you want to use the MSU library homepage as the actual link. And then that link will take them, of course, to that homepage, rather than saying, click here to chat with us from the MSU library homepage. The reason this is important um, is both for visual users, but also for users who are using a screen reader, they can call up a list of just the links in a document. Um, but if it's just a list of 12 click here's, there's no context as to where each of those is taking them. Considering color, uh, high color contrast um, is something that we need to make sure that we are following. And don't rely on color alone to convey meaning. Um, this is in part due to people who are visually impaired or colorblind. So if you only make some text red, for example, to try to highlight it as an important note, um, maybe also make it bold so that anyone who can't see color um, can have a separate visual cue of that being bold as well. We'll talk about accessibility checkers, but I wanted to specifically mention that there are color contrast checkers. Um, and the one that I use is an actual download to the computer um, so that you can use it with anything that is showing up on your screen, whether it's um, a Word document, whether you're in press books, whether you're online somewhere or in a PDF. Um, so this is one option and I'll share some other options as well. 
or you can also just stick with black and white and or super dark colors um, on a light background or vice versa. Captions. Captions are synchronous text versions of the spoken word presented within multimedia. And these are, uh, the synchronous part is showing the captions at the same time uh, that the youth that someone is speaking or that there is sound being presented within uh, the multimedia. And people benefit uh, who have hearing impairments or people without access to audio. Um, or maybe you have access to audio, but you are in a noisy or quiet environment. Maybe it's too noisy for you to really hear and you don't have headphones. Um, so you can use the captions or vice versa. It's super quiet and you don't have headphones and you don't want to play that um, content out loud. It also helps English as a second language uh, users and because lots of times people speak a lot quicker and it's easier to follow along um, in a written language. And you can generate automatic captions for videos using YouTube. So that's one option uh, that is freely available. And there are many other options for uh, uploading a video and generating captions, or um, there are also some options for live captioning, uh, either in a PowerPoint or in Teams, um, a lot of Microsoft products, but there are other options for those kind of live and automatic captions as well. Oops. And then lastly, uh, recording tips for captions. Uh, you may not be actually recording the material yourself, but this is something that you can pass on uh, to maybe an author of OER if they are including any recorded content themselves. Speak clearly, slowly, and close to a microphone, and that will help those automatic captions as well. Transcripts are a separate written document of the audio. And these benefit people with vision impairments without access or uh, people without access to video. And they do not have to be verbatim accounts of the spoken word in a video. Uh, sorry, my middle bullet point here somehow got, uh, got ran together. Uh, so that one's supposed to be a couple of different bullet points. Uh, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so these can be written beforehand. They don't have to be verbatim accounts of the spoken word in a video. Um, it just has to convey the same content that was conveyed um, in the audio. And these can be searchable by all users, um, which is super helpful um, if you have a video as part of an OER, or maybe that's the only, uh, maybe the OER is a video, then having a transcript can help users search for a specific topic and then jump to that place in the video um, to go back or just use the transcript to review the content. Some language considerations. Uh, in general, we want to try to be clear, concise, um, and use plain language. So that means avoiding or, or explaining jargon uh, with different subject material. We all have different areas of jargon, um, and oftentimes that is necessary, but explaining it ahead of time um, or having either a glossary or an index of terms uh, can help users who may be unfamiliar or new to those terms. Same with acronyms, uh, spelling out acronyms. And with OER, the length will depend. Um, you know, the best practice is to first spell out the whole acronym um, and then put the acronym in parentheses. And 
If you are have a really long OER, um, then possibly spelling out those acronyms um, at the beginning of each major section uh, might be a best practice. And avoid abbreviations. Again, just spelling everything out uh, so that users know exactly what you're talking about. And some other formatting considerations. Uh, using a non-serif font, uh, including Helvetica, Veranda, Arial, the non-serif is easier to read, um, has been proven that, especially on screens. So a lot of OER these days um, you know, are intended for almost all use on a screen. Uh, there are, of course, many, there are, of course, other formats that may be used, but a lot of times we're looking at the content on a screen. Ideally, uh, using at least one and a half times line spacing, this will, again, de depend on your formatting, but just trying to optimize the white space and uh, maybe just make it longer instead of trying to pack everything in on a small page. And using bullet points and lists uh, can really help break up long paragraphs of information. If it does need to be presented in a paragraph form, uh, just be generous with your paragraph breaks um, and try to break them into shorter sections. Oh, I see a comment in the chat. What about Times New Roman? Yep, Times New Roman um, is, is a great font as well. So mainly the the most common fonts also tend to be um, pretty accessible. So Arial, um, Times New Roman, Calibri um, is another one. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, and so just avoid all of the super fancy or super italic or kind of ones with curly cues um, in general. And you can also, of course, Google a font and see how accessible it is. But yes, Times New Roman is another great one. I'm into Apto now. Yes, the you may or may not have noticed the default of Microsoft products has changed has changed their default font. Which, uh, if you notice those things, it it made a big difference to me. And uh, lastly, do not place text over images. So this is really popular with memes these days um, and or infographics. It's not saying that you can never place text over images, but ideally you would not place text over images um, just so that someone who is visually impaired uh, can read the text easier. And if you do, if you do have um, an infographic, a meme, something else, uh, then having alt text, which we will get to, uh, is, is a secondary consideration for that. And bringing us to alt text. Alt text are written descriptions of an image. They are read by a screen reader in place of an image when someone uses a screen reader. And they are also displayed if an image file doesn't load properly or if um, sometimes on our campus here, we have some protections in our Outlook um, email system where images don't automatically load from outside senders. And so that's just to help uh, cut down on some spam or you know, accidentally clicking on a nefarious link. And so sometimes uh, there are just little placeholders and that alt text uh, might show visually to you or would be read by a screen reader if you're using one. And there we are longer alt text guidelines uh, from this online accessibility and instruction guide, um, which are also, which is also included in the resources as well. But there are many, um, this page has links from multiple other resources. Um, so the general alt text guidelines are to consider the context. Is it purely decorative? 
then you can mark it as decorative and you don't have to add an alt text. It will basically just be skipped. Um, so if someone was using a screen reader, it would be like that image isn't there. Does it provide context or information? If so, you need to provide alt text. We want to be as concise as possible. Usually that means one or two sentences. We don't want to repeat information provided elsewhere. So if an image goes along with a paragraph and the paragraph is talking about you know, showing a user in a classroom using a whiteboard, um, then you don't need to repeat that same information in the alt text. But anything that the user cannot glean from the text, that is what you want to provide as the alt text. Try to be objective. Don't try to interpret or analyze the, the image. Um, just explain it exactly what you see. Try to apply the same writing style and terminology as the surrounding text so that the tone, so that it just isn't a major shift in tone um, or jarring when uh, when the alt text is read. And then describing charts and graphs. This one in like super complex images, there are longer guidelines for these. So if, or if you are in um, math or sciences where you do have lots of charts and graphs, um, there are many more guidelines that we can dig into. Um, but with this one, you can try to, again, describe the main takeaway of a chart. So a pie chart, for example, that's showing percentages, say, you know, the majority uh, of people's favorite fruit is apples or whatever it is. Describe the main takeaway and then link to the full data from either that chart or the graph. And that is a best practice so that people can then um, dig into the data behind that chart as well. This, I will say, is one of is one of the biggest challenges um, is learning how to provide good alt text. And there aren't a lot of times there aren't easy answers. Um, so note that it's a challenge. It will continue to be a challenge. And um, the author is usually the best person to create the alt text because they are familiar with the content, with why that chart or graph was included, um, and can help provide the context of the image uh, rather than kind of a secondary accessibility person trying to glean what that context is. Jacqueline, and, we had yeah. somebody um, make a comment, Sarah said, I, I noticed in the Pub 101 course that it mentions that the function of the image should be conveyed. I was wondering if that meant to articulate the intent, for example, humor. However, that would involve interpretation or analysis. I think I need a better understanding of, of function. This is a great question. And this is a great example of why I think the author is the best, is always the best person to provide the alt text because as the author, um, you know if that image was trying to articulate humor or the intent behind it. Um, you certainly, if that is the main intent of the image and that is what it is trying to convey to a visual user, then yes that would be appropriate to include in the alt text. If you are reviewing something as a secondary set of eyes, or maybe you are just reviewing it for accessibility, um, then I would say that would be something to clarify with the author, if at all possible. Uh, so saying like, this is the intent that I got out of it, um, does, does this match up? But yes, um, trying to think of the context, the context, information, or intent behind it, um, and try to include that in the alt text. I hope that helps, but again, there's no 
easy answer or uh, or a one size fits all. The the answer is always it it depends. So we did have um, there was an option to do a prior homework assignment to write alt text for one of the images in this open textbook. Um, so I am actually going to bring this up. I think I shared my screen. So please let me know if you are not seeing the alt tag homework. And I will scroll slowly down to the first image, which is a pie chart. Uh, so here we have one example uh, of alt text. Uh, which says pie chart showing the numbers of undergraduate students in the United States in various demographic categories by age, enrollment status, and type of institution. For details, click here. Uh, yes, and uh, you, so this is a, a great option to for, give the overall intent or of what this image is showing and then clicking out to the full data um, so that users could then access that. Um, I would, one other thing I would add here um, is that looking at this pie chart visually, um, as a visual user, I can see that it looks like about two thirds fall into two categories of traditional students or looking at the colors here, two-year students. Um, so I might just add that one piece of content to this alt text. Um, you know, roughly two-thirds um, are between traditional and two-year students. Uh, the remaining are such and such. Um, but their alt text is an art. It's not a specific science. So there will never be a perfect answer. Um, there are lots of ways that it can be good. And you can say it in a lot of the same, same, there are lots of different ways that you could say it um, and say it well. I'm gonna jump down, scroll down to the next. Um, and here, one alt text example says classroom with students at desks and teacher speaking with the students in front of a projected image. That's great. And then another option, Classroom with young students facing away from the camera, sitting at many desks pushed together. Instructor strands in front of the room, speaking with the projection on the whiteboard behind him. And so if you are not looking at the screen, um, it's kind of interesting to maybe hear these alt text examples without seeing the image and seeing what it is conveying to you. Uh, and again, uh, one has a little bit more detail, one has less. There isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer, um, but thinking about the context in which this image is placed um, and what it's trying to convey. Lastly, I think there's one more, this one. Um, the last one is a, a meme of sorts. Uh, so the first example says, uh, this image presents six images representing different aspects of the experience of being a student. It is labeled the student experience, described in greater detail here. Link out to a full description. This is um, a great example of how you can share briefly within that one to two sentence um, what it is trying to convey. And then if the user wants more or needs more of the context, they can link to a fuller, longer description. Um, this is a good example when you do have lots of information to convey um, and maybe the student needs it some of the time, but not all of the time. Um, this can allow the user to choose whether they hear that full long description or not. The second, Example of alt text for this same image is six images with captions representing the student experience from perspectives of society, friends, parents, professors, students' aspirations, and reality intended to be humorous. 
see full description at um, and include the link. So yeah, th those are both um, really great examples. And if you link to the fuller detailed description, then it might be something that says um, the first image shows with has a caption what society thinks I do with um, a person at a party dancing. Second image it with has the caption what my friends think I do with an image of a ton of books stacked up and a basketball and a coffee pot. Third image uh, has the caption what my parents think I do with an icon for an A plus of great work saying I only am working on schoolwork and getting straight A's. There are three other images included in this image if you're not um, currently looking at it, but I'll I'll just stop there as an example. So you could go on um, and describe them in fuller detail. I see a question here. Would it be totally against the rules to make the alt text longer to convey all of those images? No, it would not be against the rules to make the alt text longer. Um, you could do it either way. And again, that kind of comes back to ultimately the, the intent of it. Um, if, you know, a short description allows people to move on past it to the content um, and not get too overwhelmed with a longer alt text description, but it means that users would then have to click that extra link to get that secondary explanation. So, um, so no, you could certainly just outline um, and try to describe all of the six images that are included in this one either. And that would be up to um, ultimately the author as kind of trying to weigh those trade-offs um, and how you want, how you think the user will best interact. And with that, I'm going to jump back over. I will post, um, I'll give you some more time for alt text homework if you wanna try your hand at this. And then I will post um, some of my suggested alt text as well, so you can compare. I see another question, is there a difference between alt text and image description? No, uh, they, are, they are used interchangeably. Okay, we only have a couple more minutes left. I wanna leave time for questions. Um, so some of this I am going to speed through, but you do have access to the slides. Um, I wanna note there are many different document types uh, for OER from PDFs, EPUBs, audiobooks, press books. They all have different accessibility considerations. Um, so some are reflowable and change the font size. Some like PDFs maintain the original visual layout. The takeaway here is that you can usually save in multiple formats. So trying to save um, an OER, this example, I won't open it just out of time, but um, I have an example here that is shown with an EPUB, a PDF, an HTML option. Um, and I know for example, in press books, you can export as an EPUB and as a PDF, um, same with Word. So just trying to provide as many options as possible um, will help users pick what works best for them. And we talked about a lot of these different best practices, but how do you actually ensure that these are met? You could take a centralized approach where one person checks accessibility and then helps authors update the content. But that means you have to have someone who's like tasked with accessibility in your office and you, it may just be you. You may have a whole team of people, um, but it may just be you. So a lot of times there can, is a distributed model where authors are responsible providing the accessible content um, to you as the, as the publisher, as a person helping them to publish their content. Um, and then uh, you or someone else can provide resources to the author to learn on their own. But ultimately it's up to the author um, to do the work and make it accessible. Or there's something in between. So I would like to hear how folks are handling this on their own campuses. Uh, if you want to put that in chat and or save time um, during our 
questions and answers. And then accessibility checkers. Um, I won't go too much into detail here, but there are options for accessibility checkers in Word. There are accessibility checkers for PDFs using the Adobe Acrobat accessibility checker. There are some other web-based options. So the WAVE tool is one of the most common ones um, that will check anything online uh, with a URL. So if you publish as an HTML or something like that. And then there are some browser extensions that you can use. Um, I see in the chat, um, there's one for Pressbooks. Ooh, I'm going to include that in the future. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and a whole list of other ones for color contrast checkers um, if, versus if you are in Chrome or the Wave tool will also do it. Um, so there are multiple options for color contrast, which aren't always included. Um, so here, they don't check everything. Uh, they don't always check color contrast. They don't check if headers are used. They don't check the reading order or the fact that you used jargon or acronyms. Um, so it's, again, it's still a human element. So while AI is a lot of these tools and checkers um, are built on AI, AI can really help with digital accessibility. And I'm sure there will be new things in the future that we haven't even thought of. But the main takeaway is that a human is still needed to ensure accessibility. Uh, so please tell me if you have other AI related um, tools or resources. And lastly, uh, self-care. You don't have to be perfect. Perfection is not the goal. It can't be since 100% accessible doesn't exist. But just try, you know, we're trying to do the best we can. Uh, be kind to yourself, practice self-compassion. Um, and with that, we do have more resources and training options uh, that are included in the slides. You can always reach out to me. Um, but what questions do you have? Uh, was, there, was there anything else in the chat that I missed for questions? Or feel free to answer other, ask other questions too. Thank you, Jacqueline, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I didn't catch any more questions. I know that many of us have been sharing a lot of resources to, with each other. And I think that's wonderful. Like if you can save the chat or copy and paste it into a document that might help you out. Um, we do have a Padlet activity. So the Pub 101 committee is going to revise the curriculum for OER authors. And I'll share the link to our Padlet where we'd like you to share your thoughts about what you would like your OER authors to know about accessibility, formatting for accessibility, or the topic in general. So if you haven't used Padlet before, um, go ahead and click on the link that's in the chat right now. It should open up a new browser window and look for today's topic, which is session two, accessibility, April 17th, and click the plus sign next to the topic. It'll open up, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. It'll open up a uh, sticky note where you can add your comments and then you would um, click the publish button. So go ahead and give that a try like we'll just take a few minutes here to collect people's thoughts yes the link to the slides and the recording will be in our orientation document and let me give you a link again to our web page that has that orientation document linked to Oops, I went directly to Karen. Let me send it to everybody here. There we go. Can everybody see that link tree? That's where the orientation document's at. Okay, check. Oh, yeah. Somebody has a college accessibility resources department. Yep. Uh, ours is 
not staffed heavily and I assume other people's aren't staffed very heavily either. So it really does help for everybody to know about accessibility, how to format for accessibility, what to look for, um, how to use those checkers. Yep, we can't be perfect. We will try our best together, yep, and learn from mistakes, yep. Yeah, to think about accessibility first when you first start authoring. Yeah, just some training and accessibility before you start is a wonderful thing to do. Yeah, using accessibility checkers throughout creation. Those are all excellent ideas. And thank you for those. Um, so if anybody has any more questions for Jacqueline, can you please post them in the chat? Uh, but you can also raise your hand. I can call on you if you want to speak. Pretty quiet bunch. You guys know so much already, right? <laughs> it was a good presentation. It was excellent. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Darcy. Yeah. There, there have been a lot of resources being posted, but if others... Um have more resources um, or other tips for how it's worked for you, please put those in the chat as well. Where is the more detailed alt text linking to? Um, from my slides, uh, if you were talking about that link, um, it goes to a libguide that we have here at Montana State University Library, um, which is an instruction and in accessibility uh, best practices guide, um, and there's a section for for alt text um, that then um, has multiple options for complex images, uh, the general guidelines, um, etc. I apologize. I I don't think oh. it was clear. I what I mean is like when we're writing the alt text, you you say you know see more details at and that sort of thing. So where are we directing this to? I, I mean, assuming is this like back matter in a book? style and what if it's not book style I just was curious where are you where are your recommendations for linking to because yes. a lot of the stuff doesn't already exist somewhere right um that could be in multiple places again it depends um and so for example on our libguides sometimes um we have an infographic and underneath it will say clip um you know see the alt text um and that clicks just to a separate LibGuide page um, that is either included in the same LibGuide and it just has another page that says um, infographic alt text, or I've also seen where people have just one big LibGuide for all of their alt text somewhere, um, and then they link out to that. So the short answer is you just have to decide where you're gonna put it and what makes sense for your format, put it there and then get the link and link to it. If that is not an option because of the format, then just provide a longer alt text um, in, in the context itself. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, Kim thank had, you. Sorry, Kim Kale has a question too. She's asking about the cover in the back, if there are images too. If they are providing extra information, um, lots of times the alt text could be for like a cover image could just be the title of the book and the authors, like just the text that is involved. Um, if they're, you know, if it's chemistry and there are some beakers on the front and you also want to tell them that there's a picture of beakers, then that's fine. But oftentimes the cover is decorative in a way that it isn't specifically conveying certain information. Um, but if it is, then you can provide alt text for them as well. Okay, I see applause coming in. Excellent presentation. And we can certainly share the link to the YouTube presentation with our faculty authors also. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so if I'll be respectful of people's time, if there's no more questions, um, we just want to thank you again for joining us as we continue to learn about open textbook publishing. And we hope that as we continue to share available resources and recommendations that one of your key takeaways is the sense that you're not alone in figuring out how to support open textbook authors. And next Wednesday, we're gonna have a presentation on inclusion in online publishing by Christina Trunell. So we hope you can join us next Wednesday. And thank you again, Jacqueline. Thank Everyone, you have a great rest of the day.